on the phone, professor of history from Cornell University, Edward Baptist, on his book, The Half That Has Never Been Told. Uh, welcome to the program, Professor. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so let's start. We, ha we have to start with this just because uh, The Economist um, uh, wanted us to. I'm speaking of The Economist magazine. Uh, and you received a, I think it was an uncredited review at The Economist, uh, but they, I guess they don't do uh, the bylines. Um, criticizing your book on slavery, saying that you were, um, you were unfair to the slave owners, which I assume was one of the assumptions of slavery that uh, you set out uh, to debunk in your book. Just um, uh, tell us your response to that uh, review. Well, the review said a couple of, of really interesting things. One of them was it, it uh, complained that in the book, according to, according to the reviewer, all of the slaves were victims and all of the slave owners were villains. And people on social media reacted, in particular to the, the second point that they made. And they said, well, you know, by definition, <laughs> on some level, all slave owners were villains because they you know, participate in, in a system that we now judge as villainous. So I think the book, um, on one level, sort of digs into the, you know, the different layers of that, the ways in, in which slavery was connected to larger systems, the ways in which it exploited people, and the ways in which it was a profoundly violent system, even when enslavers might have thought of themselves as not being the perpetrators of that, or the direct perpetrators of that violence, they actually were the perpetrators of that violence. Uh, over over time, it seems that the uh, the the perception, I mean that uh, the perceptions around that dynamic, that um, in many respects, um, uh, slave owners were were benevolent and um, you know brought new opportunity to the slaves. I mean, it seems sort of ridiculous to say it now, but that that perception. Um, had a lot of durability, didn't it? Yeah, it has had a lot of durability. And I think if, if you think about the ways that we, we talk about violence against enslaved people or the ways at times that we don't talk about it or talk about it as something other than violence, you'll see exactly how, how durable it's been. Because we have a special category in the way that we think about violence for the whippings that are, that are done to uh, that, were, that were done to enslaved people. I mean, for a long time, historians talked about this as a kind of discipline, right? Uh, as if it was a way that you would train your pet or a way that you would, you would discipline your child. Uh, and, and then uh, at times when historians pointed out that uh, sometimes these whippings were quite violent, uh, they also often backtracked and suggested that they were not an inherent part of the system. But what my research shows and what other historians have, have been showing as well is, is that, in fact, it was systematic, that whipping was directly calibrated to production uh, on, on these uh, slave labor camps to make cotton, and that cotton was the most important product in the world in the early 1800s. So it was really violence that was, that was incessant and that was very well organized that drove the expansion of the Western economy. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the 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 the, the point that I think, uh, or the points around that that are uh, so incredibly illuminating. The 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 idea that so much of this was was systematized, and I mean, one could almost draw a line between the the amount of whipping and sort of a a, a bond rate in some way, right? I mean, yeah. and th maybe yeah. that's carrying it just a little bit too far, but. Um, but 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 walk us through walk us through that. I mean, I, I'm particularly fascinated about this element of of the system uh, in light of uh, an interview I did a couple of weeks ago with with Chris Hayes, who has written about uh, comparing the involvement of capital uh, and the extraction of value from slaves with the involvement with, of capital and the extraction of value when it comes to fossil fuels. Obviously, from a moral sense, there's, there's no comparison. But on that level, um, it, is, um, it, it is interesting to, to view it in that light. Yeah, I, I think uh, there, there are multiple kinds of, of uh, if you will, free 
um, free labor or free capital or stolen capital. Um, I think they're probably stolen capital is the best way to think about it, that, that go into the construction of the, the worldwide global economy, which is supposedly based solely on, on the free interchange of, of uh, wage labor and capital uh, and, and really complicate our understanding of it. But very specifically, in this case, it, it worked like, like this. So an enslaved person who would be, let's say, sold from Virginia to Mississippi would be brought onto the plantation, or as I call them, slave labor camps. And the first day they were supposed to pick cotton, and picking cotton was this crucial bottleneck in the production process, right, that really wasn't solved by machine until the 1950s. But uh, they were told to pick cotton, uh, and this would establish their sort of basic rate. And then the job of the enslaver and his overseer, as they saw it, would be to push that basic rate up. So if the enslaved person fell short of their quota on the second day, they would be whipped. And often it was, it was very calibrated. They would be whipped the same number of lashes as they were pound short. Once they could regularly meet that quota, the quota would then rise they would be required to pick more. And everybody had an individual quota that was tailored to what they had done in the past and what the slave owner thought they could do in the future or the next day. And over time, what you find is that the average picking rate rises 2% per year from 1800 to 1860, so that it's four times faster. People are picking cotton four times faster in 1860 than they are in 1800. And this makes a massive difference. It, even as the demand for cotton is rising, as the worldwide factory system grows and people are buying these clothes left and right, and clothes are getting much cheaper all the time, even as that's happening, the actual price of cotton, the real price, the inflation-adjusted price of cotton is dropping to 25% of what it had been in 1800. And this is the primary reason why. And, and, and so to what extent did slave owners, I mean, how scientific were they uh, in, in making that determination of, of what would increase productivity? In other words, w w w were there actual sort of experiments, A, B tests as to what would create more, um, uh, uh, would, would get more productivity out of their slaves? Yeah, we we don't. Uh, to my knowledge, we don't we don't know of any sort of organized experiments uh, that happen. You know, there's some sort of haphazard uh, tests, uh, or or there's haphazard discussion about what seeds are best, what plowing methods are best, and so on. But I think they don't really need to experiment uh, when it comes to driving people to pick faster because they've found a system that works, and the, the evidence of that is all around them. It's there in the in the records they keep and. Uh, in the records of increased pr production. But if you want to think about it for a minute, you can see that actually the if there is an experiment, right, if there is a process of sort of uh, time and man time and uh, movement study that's going on, that that study is actually being carried out by enslaved people on themselves. You know, the experimentation, the scientific management is being outsourced to them by the enslaver by force. They have to figure out how to do it. They have mm -hmm. to figure out how to move faster all the time. And so it's their creativity, their experimentation that's responsible for this massive rise in production. But of course it's extracted at a horrific cost. And it's it's not free. It's not free labor uh, in that sense. Uh, you use the, the, the metaphor of uh, a body to describe a slavery. And, um, and, and I think you suggest you take that from um, the, the author Ralph Ellison, uh, who described U.S. history as a vast drama being played out on, on a Negro giant. Talk about uh, why you use that uh, metaphor and how. Well, um, at, a, at a certain level, it's, it's something that, uh, you know, that, that uh, I more or less intuited after reading um, Ellison and, and, and struggling with his problem of how to organize the book. And then I, I tried it and I uh, saw that it, it worked in certain ways. But the, the problem of organizing the book was that uh, you, can, you can write a history book uh, chronologically. Uh, we say this happened and then this happened and then that happened and A caused B to happen, which caused C to happen. Or you can write it topically where you say, okay, here I'll talk about labor, here I'll talk about family, here I'll talk about politics. And putting those two together, right, so that you have a book that moves both chronologically and topically is a challenge. But I think it's, uh, it's the best way to organize a book, especially if you're talking about a big phenomenon that you're trying to connect to the, the whole of, of U.S. history. 
And I found that that talking about um, uh, that, that using the body as a metaphor actually worked because I could demonstrate the ways in which enslavers tried to build up power and tried to build up control, often by literally isolating the the parts of enslaved people's bodies and making them work against enslaved people's own interests, making their feet move them, uh, move enslaved people from Virginia to Mississippi uh, while their hands were chained together, making their hands pick faster, even though picking faster actually only meant you would have to pick faster still the next day. So connected to a lot of different issues in the book. But, you know, at a certain level, it's one of those things that you just come to intuitively and either it works or it doesn't. So I guess the readers will will let me know about that. Uh, but let's talk about um, the that uh, that dynamic of, of sort of the internal, I guess, uh, forced migration of slaves. What 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 brought that about, and um, how did that how did that uh, how did that play out? What what brought it about was that in the the 1780s, there's a very large enslaved population in in Virginia, North Carolina, and Maryland. But uh, the products that they they make uh, most successfully there, tobacco and grain, uh, were not bringing enough money on the world market to pay the debts that those enslavers like Thomas Jefferson, for instance, owed. Uh, and and some enslavers reacted to that and to uh, you know the the ideas of the American Revolution and in some cases to religious conversion by actually freeing uh, enslaved people. But others uh, saw that there was a growing market in South Carolina and Georgia where cotton was just coming into cultivation. There was a growing market there, and so they helped to create this uh, domestic internal slave trade, which is going to expand and continue uh, as, a, as a process of moving enslaved laborers from one place to another, all the way up until 1865, in fact, as right before Richmond Falls, there are still slaves being sold in, in, in Richmond itself. And this is a really uh, interesting, organized process in which market systems grow and change dramatically over time. They're r- repeatedly innovated, uh, but they they really get better and better at connecting uh, one set of sellers to another set of buyers. And, and in that sense, it's a classic capitalist story. And, 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 and this, uh, it was in the, the, the first decade of the 1800s, I believe, is when we stopped, when we, when we made it illegal, is that right, to import yeah. slaves? And so, That's right. And so that sort of like internal trade became that much more relevant. It, 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 I mean, it really is... You step back and you see it is it is a you know almost like it's it's a it's an efficiency uh, issue right for these people for the for the slave owners on some level right yeah I mean in a sense it, it, well the U S had had developed this uh, large um, enslaved population in the Upper South uh, and so uh, one way to look at it is to say that uh, they didn't need the Middle Passage anymore in order to expand slavery uh, in the United States and, and move enslaved people to where they uh, where they could produce the most profit for their owners. But I, I think the consequences of it are, are really significant. I mean, one is that one consequence is that it, it builds this speculation uh, in African American bodies right into the fabric of American society, uh, Amer- uh, into white society. And it also um, repeatedly exposes people to um, just horrible things that are being done to enslave people's bodies right in front of them. And the same thing happens with the whipping on the plantation. And so they, they come up with all sorts of ways to, to justify this and articulate it. And I think when we see experiments today uh, in which we, uh, we find that, that observers don't see the level of pain that African Americans are ex- experiencing in a particular medical procedure, as being equivalent to the level of pain that that whites are experiencing in the same medical procedure, I think, I think we start to see some potentially of, potentially some of the long term consequences of this, um, you know, this this uh, deeply embedded process of cruelty in everyday life. Uh, uh, expand on that um, as to the, the the legacy of that. Well, I I think that. Um, in the process of slavery, um, white people in general in the United States uh, 
got used to thinking of uh, African American people's bodies as resources to be exploited, or you know, even if you're an abolitionist, they were resources to be debated about, and to be uh, calculated on in a, in a different way. And I don't mean to say there's a moral equivalence between abolitionists and enslavers, because there really wasn't. But even there, it was hard for them to get out of that that trap about of uh, of talking about African Americans as they were as if they were not um, fully equivalent to whites. And so, uh, in particular, I think the the violence uh, that's done to uh, enslaved people repeatedly continues to play out, uh, and and uh, African Americans are are uh, seen throughout U.S. history as a, a population that needs to be controlled. Even white abolitionists are very frightened of the possibility of slave revolt. See it in some ways as a great, in some cases, as a greater evil than slavery itself, and. This this continues. I'm I'm convinced it plays out in the ways that uh, um, policing is done in the United States, and I'm convinced it's you know it's playing out today in the events that that we see dramatized in Ferguson and St. Louis. How do you think that that happens? I mean, I you know, and and maybe this is outside of uh, of your uh, of your portfolio, as it were. But I mean, how does uh, I mean, th- I would imagine in the context of history, you see these sort of uh, ideas and these notions and these perspectives of, uh, uh, of that one group of people has on another. And even I would imagine on some level that is internalized uh, by those groups that are sort of, particularly those that are sort of subjugated to a broader society. How, how are those communicated through uh, through the years? Well, I think I think there are a lot of ways it's communicated. I, I think what I I can probably talk the most usefully, uh, what I can probably speak the most usefully to would would be our perceptions of history. And, and let's let's go back to to talking uh, talking about how people have talked about whipping over the years. So in any other context, we would call the things that were done on a routine basis in order to produce more cotton. We would call those things that were done to African Americans' bodies torture. We would certainly Call it torture if a you know if an American pilot was shot down and captured by ISIL or something like that, um, because these were truly brutal whippings that cut people's skin open and and you know to refine the cruelty even more enslavers did other things uh, you know that that, that uh, there's simply an endless law, uh, list of the kinds of things that that they did which the UN would certainly define as torture but we don't call it torture right we don't call it torture in our history. Uh, we we might call it labor discipline. We might even call it whipping, but that doesn't get and it doesn't begin to get to the actual violence that was done uh, and that uh, people simply accommodated uh, into their daily lives as as whites. Uh, the the presence of these things in their own societies, uh, they found a way to deal with it even as they were outlawing those kinds of punishments uh, when it came to whites. So. In the early 19th century, at the very beginning, you could still uh, have your ear cut off or have your hand branded or something like that if you were a white thief. Uh, but instead, other kinds of punishments are invented specifically because they don't do to white bodies what is being done on a routine basis to black bodies. It marks the difference between them, treats them as bodies, treats white bodies as bodies with more dignity, and black bodies as, as bodies which can be torture, which pain can and should be inflicted upon. We, we don't even seem to have a, uh, a, a term or a concept for, for, for that, do we? I mean, it, I mean, when you say whipping, you, one's mind necessarily goes to an individual act, but this was a, um, a, a this was so programmatic, uh, this torture, that we don't even have in our lexicon a way to describe it in some way, in the same way that we would, let's say, genocide, if we were to kill uh, people in this manner. We, we don't, uh, and slavery itself does not seem to be up, that term does not seem to be up to the task. Yeah, I think that's a really perceptive point. Um, we it, it comes to us in stories that are told by individuals who experienced it or they watch close relatives experience it. And these are these are stories of tremendous individual trauma and, and that's um and that's really important to think about and to talk about. But as as you point out, it's the system systematization of, of, of the whole uh, of that whole apparatus of torture 
which in some ways has an even uh, greater effect. And, you know, this is a crucial tool of um, developing and maintaining white supremacy in the United States. Uh, and it's it's bound to leave a long-term legacy, a legacy that is, uh, you know, greater than the individual life, the um, the individual lifespan. It's it's longer than the individual lifespan of, of one particular survivor or another particular survivor. So I think you're very right to point to the the system uh, that 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 side of it is crucial to understand, and I don't know what the word would be though. Yeah, I do, I don't either, and, and it's never really occurred to me that we we don't have a a a, a term for that when we would we would if we were to have engaged in the the sort of the mass killing of of millions, uh, as yeah. opposed to the sort of the, the systemic torture uh, as a as a mechanism to increase productivity and and it's not just about uh, productivity in, in for the the uh, the slave owners I mean in, in many respects there is no broader American economy for those hundred uh, plus uh, 150 years I guess without um, uh, w- without slavery, I mean, this has impacts across the country. I mean, talk about uh, uh, the the dynamic of of, of clothes uh, that uh, that where uh, clothes from the northeast are manufactured and, in some ways, I guess, uh, protected uh, through a tariff system to clothe slaves. Yeah, that's that's a, a key part of this story of U.S. industrialization. And there's a historian at Brown named uh, Seth Rockman who's who's writing a book on that now, which is going to be fantastic. But and basically, uh, what he's found so far, if I understand correctly, and and part of this is a story we've known, but but he's really expanding on it, is is that as you're suggesting, uh, there's a protected market that's created in the United States. Most of the cotton that the U.S. Uh, produces is is made by enslaved people, and most of it goes to Great Britain. Great Britain is ahead of the U.S. in the sort of industrial race, and they make finer quality cloths uh, more easily than than the sort of infant U.S. factories in Massachusetts and Rhode Island are making by the 18-teens. So what Congress does is it imposes a tariff that keeps out the cheaper cloth but opens the door to the the wealthier cloth that the middle class and the upper class is going to want to buy. And so now the the factories in in, uh, New England can... Uh, enjoy a protected market for the cloth that they make. And in particular, where they sell to is is the South, because uh, enslaved people who made a, may have uh, spun and wove their own cloth in the 1700s are now so heavily tasked picking cotton that they don't have time to do that. So enslavers buy clothes uh, made from cotton that they themselves had picked uh, and give give the cloth to, to enslaved people to sew up into clothes, actually. So they're they're participating in in that sense uh, in creating a consumer market for uh, you know for the product of the product that they make. Uh, tell us just a little bit about um, uh, Charles Ball. I want people to get the get a sense of of just how many sort of uh, personal stories and and I, I believe there was something like you had over two thousand. Sort of journal entries or uh, or, or direct correspondence um, uh, uh, from that that time that that made up uh, at least part of your research. Uh, tell us um, a little bit about Charles Ball. So what we have in terms of, uh, of words that come from formerly enslaved people, prim- primarily uh, we've got uh, about a hundred nineteenth-century uh, autobiographies and memoirs that were published by people after they got out of slavery, whether like Charles Ball, they escaped during slavery itself uh, or or after it was over. And then we've got about 2,200 interviews that were done with survivors, elderly survivors of slavery during the 1930s. And this is a, an extremely rich and complicated resource. But, but Charles Ball's story is one of the earliest to be published in the United States. It's first published in uh, 1837, I think. And he was, uh, he was born in the 1780s in Maryland. And things seem to be going as well for him as they can be going in 1805. He's got a wife and kids, and he thinks he might be able to earn enough money from side jobs on Sundays to to actually buy his freedom one day. And then he finds out that he's been sold. Uh, he finds out that he's been sold by literally being uh, kidnapped as as he experiences it. He's grabbed by a large group of white men and, and uh, put in uh, in handcuffs. 
uh, by the man who now owns him, the slave trader, who then chains him to uh, about 30 other men and marches him all the way from Maryland down to South Carolina. And that's where he learns what life is like uh, on these new slave labor camps on the cotton frontier. He has to learn how to pick. He has to uh, sort of rebuild his life and separation and isolation from his family. But one of the unique, unique things about him is that he actually escapes. In about 1808 or 1809, he leaves uh, in the middle of the night uh, and takes off and begins this odyssey of about three months uh, in winter most of the time that eventually takes him back to his wife's cabin in Maryland. And he finds out that she has not remarried. And he's able to live uh, with her for another couple of decades. And we should say that that, that, that story of, of separation from family is not... Um is not ancillary to the process, but it is, I mean, that's not a, a, a bug, but that is a feature, right? I mean, you want Absolutely. to separate them. I mean, every, all these things that we, when we look back on slavery that we see as sort of side effects are in fact um, more built into the system because there is such a, an, 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 a because of the implications of, of uh, productivity. Yeah. I mean, all slave societies, uh, some some uh, scholars argue, have these features of, of what's called social death, of ripping people out of the networks that, that give their lives meaning, you know, kinship, uh, religion, um, social practices, all these sorts of things, and forcing them to take on new names, new, new lifestyles, etc. And in the United States, by the late 1700s, most people, um, some people are still being brought from Africa, and they're experiencing that that process of social death, if you will, uh, really violently. But but many people were born in these sort of rich kinship networks, and those um, those networks and those communities gave them the opportunity and the tools to to soften some of the edges of slavery in all kinds of ways, to to make it harder uh, for enslavers to exploit them quite as successfully, for women to help protect them in some cases from sexual violence. Uh, all sorts of processes that that give them allies and and give them um, tools that they need, and so taking people out of that environment and bringing them to a new environment where they don't know any of the people who they're with, right? And and they're also experiencing this really massive life shock of separation from family, is part of what it allows enslavers to impose all all of these new conditions of work in this super uh, speeded up exploitation that, that we see. But, you know, I, I don't want to say that's the same thing that happens to immigrants and it's the same thing that happens to wage workers as industries change because it, it is different. But at the same time, we can see echoes of the constant process of change that we all experience in modernity and modernization. And that sometimes those changes are changes we seek out, but sometimes they're changes that are imposed on us for the benefit of other people. And the shock itself is one of the tools that's used to, to force us to, to accept the new conditions when perhaps we might, uh, given that we're not enslaved, we might be able to resist them if we work together more effectively. Interesting. And and, and lastly, I mean, tell us about uh, Franklin Armfield, because I think this... That firm sort of is indicative of uh, the 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 other half of this equation in terms of of, of how much of how sophisticated um, uh, I guess an element of slavery was in our economy. Yeah, that that becomes the biggest uh, firm in the slave trading business by about 1830. Uh, Isaac Franklin, John Armfield, and Rice Ballard, uh, and it has uh, offices in Baltimore and Richmond and New Orleans and, and Natchez. And it's uh, by by the early 1830s, it's moving several thousand people a year from from the southeast to the southwest. It's very sophisticated in its financial operations, very sophisticated in its advertising techniques. And if we were to really uh, get a handle, and there are some historians who are working on this question now, like Josh Rothman at the University of Alabama. If we, we were to get a real handle on how much money they were moving, uh, and I've done some ballpark calculations on this based on my own research, we would probably find that, that uh, after the big banks in the United States, this might have been the single largest firm operating in the United States in the early 1830s. And that shouldn't be a surprise because most... Um, 
enslaved men, for instance, who young men who were sold to New Orleans, uh, went in the early 1830s uh, for a sale price of anywhere between maybe $700 and $1,000. And if we work that out in today's money, uh, the different ways to calculate it, but uh, economists uh, who look at this sort of thing will tell you that that's equivalent to somewhere between $50,000 and $250,000 today. So uh, these folks, for the 1830s economy, were dealing with huge, huge sums of money, huge, huge amounts of value. And the value, of course, was based ultimately on on human bodies. And, and the thing that I think people have to understand, too, is that even in this context, they required capital, right? I mean, so this is absolutely. intimately tied into the banking system. Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's a great point. You know, they were some of the, the sort of favorite children of the of the uh of the banks and in, in all the towns where they were based because and Natchez were in New Orleans where they dealt with the Bank of the United States which was chartered by Congress it was sort of the Federal Reserve of its day or in uh in the east where they dealt with the biggest banks in Richmond and and Philadelphia and Washington DC. And those in those places these guys were great because they moved so much cash. Uh, they required credit, but they paid it back, and they paid it back with interest, and they paid it back on time. You know, this is the one product that uh, was always commanding a good price, if you will. It, I mean, that part about it is 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 really fascinating. It, do you have a sense of, of just how much the banking industry? Profited and relied on uh, the, the 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 slavery industry, for lack of a better term, uh, in terms of because when you have that type of 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 money running through your banks and you have loans that you know are are, are as close to sure bets as you can get, and massive loans, it seems to me, um, that that generates all sorts of other economic development that ostensibly has nothing to do with slavery. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's very true. And and the the fact that, you know, the fact that it's even controversial to talk about this now is is uh, is, I think, very telling of the way that we've tried to avoid coming to terms with some very basic facts. Uh, Here's here's one very basic fact. Cotton accounted for 50 percent of the value of all U.S. exports in almost every year before 1860. So it's absolutely crucial to the U.S. economy. Of course, it's made by slaves. Uh, enslaved people were 20% of all of the wealth in the United States during just about every uh, decade before 1860. So, uh, and not only are they 20%, they're also the most liquid 20% for the reasons you just suggested. You know, they're, they're great collateral because you can always sell a human being and find a market in antebellum America. So. Uh, the banks absolutely rely uh, on uh, on slaves as uh, you know one of the crucial counterweights in the economy, one of the crucial kinds of capital that enables them to make other kinds of loans. But also, of course, uh, the product that they make, cotton, allows the constant flow of of credit, commercial credit, coming in from Great Britain, uh, which then has all kinds of other effects that that lead to economic growth. And and it's this sort of I guess interwoven dependence on uh, this uh, this institution of slavery, which I which obviously made it um, something that you know aside from the 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 moral issues, but why it was so wrenching to uh, to get rid of that institution. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um, it's very hard to convince. Uh, People to give up 20% of of national wealth, uh, especially the people for whom that's 100% in effect of of their particular wealth, and and often those people were extremely political power powerful, uh, and you know that's that's why we have a long conflict over the expansion of slavery, and that long conflict of the ex, over the expansion of slavery is is why the United States ends up in a civil war. Professor Edward Baptist, uh, the book is The Half Has Never Been Told. We will link to it at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks for talking to me. Enjoyed it.